This morning I want to talk to you about a topic that I think I struggle with sometimes, and maybe you do, maybe you do not. But as you hear what I'm going to teach on this morning, if it is something that uh, does hit you where you think, you know, I need to work on that. The funny thing is sometimes as you teach on a topic, the Holy Spirit, if you let him, can teach it on you, on whatever you need to help him with today. So I want you to be open and receptive to that and, and jump into this topic. So the first thing, if you want to put that up there, if you have a slide, I think is, do you ever find yourself that, is that deaf interpreter really that he's trying to do that? I, I was going to pat him on the head and tell him he did a good job, but I guess I won't. Do you find yourself rushing for no reason, get caught up looking for the next thing to do? Do you ever find yourself doing that? You just find yourself rushing through life and there's really no point? Do you ever find yourself at a stoplight and the guy next to you tries to jump the green light? You're not in a hurry at all, but all of a sudden you are in a hurry because you want to beat him. I know to some people, if they ever use their phone or they use a GPS or something that says you will arrive at this time, they're not in a hurry. But they go crazy to beat whatever time is on that screen. And then they brag about how many minutes they beat the arrival timelines. Anybody know anybody like that? My wife does not like it when I get into a hurry. She likes me to move at a pace that's normal for her and, and that she, she can enjoy life. But sometimes I get in a hurry and I have no reason to even be in a hurry. I find myself rushing to eat a meal. And there's no reason to rush to eat a meal. Have any of you ever done that before? You sit down with a friend, you sit down with your family, and you find yourself eating so fast, and you have to stop and say, why am I eating fast? We almost become addicted to being in a hurry. And we don't have a reason. Now some of you are thinking, I have nothing to do, I'm, in, I'm not in a hurry. All right, well you can get busy, you can find something to do, you can get yourself motivated. Well, I have nothing on my schedule. Let me challenge you to get something on your schedule or agenda. And sometimes we're just distracted. You're never fully present with somebody. You're distracted by the phone, you're distracted by what you're thinking about, you're distracted by what you're going to do next. You're never fully present in any conversation, never fully present as you're walking through a crowd. You never find yourself engaging with people. But we get so addicted to just being in a hurry. Some people call life a rat race. As you see this, you can get so caught up in the morning. You, you get out of bed, and some of you get out of bed a little later. Have you ever done that? The first decision of the day, you hit the snooze button. Have you ever done that before? That's a great way to start off your day, isn't it? Or you turn the alarm off. Then you really get running behind, and then you're having the type of day that you know is going to be a bad day. And you start down that spiral of having a bad day, and your life becomes a rat race. You're rushing. You may skip breakfast, or you may grab something that you regret later on that you're eating for breakfast. Your kids, are you supposed to eat that, Mom? Hey, don't worry about that. Uh, you, you know, as you're eating a candy bar, you're eating that chocolate cake, you're drinking that soft drink for breakfast, tell your kids, eat healthy. Not like I am. All right, so you have those... The, the decision to make right there, and it's a bad one. Life comes a rat race. You get so rushed, and you're driving fast to work. Then you, as you get to work, you're in a kind of rush mood, and you're in that habit of being in a hurry. So before long, you're just rushing through your day, and you never take time for individuals. You never take time for people. And you don't even know why you're so intensely in a hurry. When I'm that way, I find myself not making any small talk. I find myself not taking time for any relationship. I found myself cutting people off, saying, get to the point. And if you've, I've been married 26 and a half years, and I work hard. Men, I don't know if you've ever made this mistake. And I do it unintentionally. But ladies like to give details when they talk. Has anyone ever noticed that before? I like to kind of cut to the chase and make it a very efficient conversation. Sometimes my wife who's very capable and smart and competent. But she sometimes likes to take her time getting to the point of conversation. And sometimes I feel like tying my right hand down. Because what I find myself doing, at least in the past, I've become much better, is she would start getting distracted and tell me other things, and my right hand, on its own, would start doing this. That's a terrible idea. I, don't, I do it totally subconsciously. It must be the Lord moving my hand. Maybe the devil, because it didn't ever work out well for me when I did that. I had great intentions. When you do that, you're basically saying what? I'm too busy, speed it up, right? Oh, she sped it up all right. <laughs> <laughs> but 
But I do that for no reason. I chose to spend my life with her. I love being married to her. My wife's terrific. But my, my life can, be some, can become a blur of hurry where now I'm too busy to let my wife talk about her day, share her feelings, and connect with me. She's choosing me to talk to. And I've been, in the past, so caught up in getting things done that I try to speed her up. If I ever take the time to pray, sometimes I have a hard time getting to the point. But I don't think the Lord is telling me to hurry up. I think he's saying, hey, I'm glad you're talking to me. What else do you need? He makes my feelings a priority. He listens to me. He's never in too big of a hurry for me. So we make life a rat race. Where our spiritual lives should be anything but a rat race. Now the first three indicators that God lives in us are love, joy, and peace. Hurry robs us of those three things. Hurry robs us of me showing love. Because when I'm in a hurry, you know what I don't take time to do? Show up. You know what I, hurry can rob me of is my joy. Because I don't enjoy life. I'm getting through life. I'm existing in life. And instead of enjoying nature, instead of enjoying talking with my family or my friends, instead of enjoying sitting down and reading a book, or instead of enjoying just seeing the nature as I drive to work or taking a walk, instead of doing that, I'm so caught up in getting things done. It robs me. Oh, by joy. I find joy then in buying something new. I find joy in something pleasing me. I can rush all day long to get through life so I can get home and do nothing but watch TV or do something and play a game that I want to do. And it's just a distraction to distract me from the fact that I'm in a blur of hurry. I'm addicted to just being in a hurry. Is it even possible to eliminate hurry and enjoy life more. Is that even possible? Do you ever feel like I do and wonder if it's even possible to have a life without hurry, being caught up in such a rat race, being caught up in such a get things done mentality that you can't ever enjoy it anymore? You find yourself checking your messages and emails and social media constantly so you never get behind, so you never miss out on anything. And as you're checking your emails, as you're checking your social media accounts, as you're rushing to watch the next TV show, as you're doing that, you're missing what life is all about. Go by in front of our own face. Because we get busy. There are people that God puts on your path that he wants you to show his love to them. And he chose you to say, you know what? I pick you. That person needs to feel my love. I pick you, and yet I can become so busy. I can be so, so caught up in my own priorities that I miss those opportunities. And then I get frustrated with God and say, God, you're not using me. And God says, man, I've been trying. You're not letting me. I can say, God, I want to be used by you. God, I want to help people. And he said, man, I keep putting them on your path, but you're so busy getting your stuff done, you miss my stuff. I'm so caught up in doing my will, sometimes I miss God's will. I get so caught up in finding my way to find my way to peace and finding my way. I want to watch this show. I want to play this game. I want to go on this trip. I want to live my life. I want to be more productive at work. I want to make more money. I want to get a bigger title. God, I want to just be busy, busy, busy. And we get so caught up in hurrying her through life and my dreams that I miss God's will for my life. Sometimes it's so ridiculous. I find myself, when I have a night where I actually could sit down and eat a meal with my family. I feel guilty about it, think something's wrong, because I can't, I can't be this, this much time. I have to be busy. And you find things to create, is you can't not be doing anything but enjoying what God gave you. When's the last time you just took a walk outside, just said, you know what, God, I just want to talk with you for a little bit. When's the last time you didn't get distracted, you took your phone down, 
put it on airplane mode, just say, you know what, God, I just need to take a drive and talk to you. If you're married, when's the last time you just sat with your spouse and ate a meal and not discussing the problems of the day or what bills you got to pay or one thing that went wrong, but you just talked about what you enjoy about life and what you think what's going on in your life and how good God is, and you just took the time to enjoy each other. If you're a parent, when's the last time you just did something with your kid and got on the floor with them if they're little and just played a little game with them and wrestled with them or played hide-and-go-seek with them? Man, remember, I can't remember my kids now. They're all pretty much adults. If I tried to play peekaboo with them, they'd be like, Dad, are you serious right now? Um, but, but some of you have kids at that age. Take the time to do that. Take the time to get in your knees and let them ride in your back. I cannot tell you how many times I had just sore knees and scabs on my knees from giving my kids horsey rides. I thought for sure they'd get tired of them at some point. Now, my wife tried to get up, give, have me give her a horse ride. I drew the line there. I said, that's enough. I'm not doing that. But as you go through life, hurry becomes your normal mode of operation. You just become so addicted to it, you just rush through one thing to get to the next. You go to one appointment to the next. You go from one thing to the next, and it becomes such an addiction that even when you sit down, you have to have some entertainment in front of you, whether it's a game, whether it's social media, whether it's a TV show, whether it's a movie, whatever it is, that becomes your crutch because you have to have something in front of your eyes. You can't just sit there and be present for the Lord or for those around you. This is the time you just sat. Maybe I like to do this in the morning. Some people aren't. Morning people, I like to do it in the morning. But when's the last time you just read your Bible quietly and just said, you know what, God, I enjoy this time with you? You said, man, I can't do it for a long time. I'm not asking you to do it for a long time. But just try to do it. Just take the time and sit there for three minutes, four minutes. It doesn't just sit down and say, you know what, God, it's just me and you right now. I'm not too busy for you. Because I think you'll find out. God is not too busy for you either. God craves a relationship with you. If you can't wonder what the meaning of life, and life has no point, and you just can't figure out what's going on, let me challenge you to not make hurry your normal mode of operation. What would life look like if you eliminated most of the hurry? Hopefully not like that. What would life look like? It may be time doing some things that may seem foolish, but later on are tremendous memories. How many of you have ever done something at the moment, seemed kind of spontaneous and foolish, but now you look back and think, man, that was a great time. That was a great time with my friends. That was a great time with my, my family. That was a great time that I spent. But so many of us are so caught up and so distracted in our own desires, our own trying to get things done, that really some of them don't even matter. That we are missing out on so many opportunities of life. Does it seem absolutely impossible to take control of the hurry factor? Does it seem impossible to do that? Some of you right now think, I don't know what to do. Look at my to-do list. Look at my appointments. Look at all these calendars. Look at what I have to get done. I, I understand. I can relate to that. But it is impossible. So what I thought, I'd ask myself a question today. What did Jesus, how did he handle it? You know, Corey Ten Boom had a quote that I thought was good. It says, the devil can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. If the devil can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. Because if you get too busy, you'll neglect God, you'll neglect those around you, you'll neglect your loved ones, and you will not be a light and a testimony for Christ. You'll get your to-do list done, and God's to-do list will go unchecked, unmarked, and become dry and dusty because I can be too busy doing what I want to do. Did Jesus live in this perpetual state of hurry? 
Did Jesus struggle with rushing through the day? Did Jesus struggle with telling disciples to get to the point, the people that came to him get to the point? Did Jesus struggle with being so caught up and getting through life and feeling so depleted that, you know what, I can't handle one more person wanting one more thing from me. I just got to get home and sit on the couch and watch TV and drink something. I can't ever take the time to just listen. You become so worn down inside. You're just in a hurry all the time. I don't want to see one more person. I don't want one more text. I don't want one more phone call. Man, I don't want one more email. I don't want one more problem. I don't want one more thing. What did Jesus, did he ever deal with that stress? Did he ever deal with that frustration? Did Jesus ever become so depleted that he says, look, leave me alone today. As people came to bar, did he ever say, you know what, I've got to check my email one more time. Man, I've got to check, if I get one more stupid text message from someone else wanting one more thing, if my boss calls me one more time, if my employees call me one more time with a problem, if I just have one more thing, God, I can't deal with anymore, and you feel like being alone and isolating yourself and just sitting there saying, I'm going to put myself in a little cocoon, and I'm not going to have anybody bother me, that will solve my problems. Is that where you're at? Do you live an isolated, almost depressed life because you don't want to be around people because you feel depleted, you feel wrung out, you feel like I don't have any energy left to give anyone anymore? Maybe that's where you're at. Did Jesus ever deal with that? I don't know about you, but man, when I try to get things done, one thing I struggle with is I don't like interruptions. Any of you ever like interruptions? You're in a groove, you get things going, and people want to come talk to you right then. You ever have that problem? Right when you get things going, someone that comes in at your office and they try to start talk to you and interrupt you, and you try real hard to be polite, like say, hey, get out of here, that's your polite answer. Hey, jerk, leave me alone, that's another nice polite answer. You have all sorts of these things, you get frustrated, you're, you're in a groove and people interrupt you. How do you handle those interruptions? Did Jesus ever struggle with that? How did Jesus respond to the interruptions of life? Because sometimes I'm not good at that. Sometimes I view people as the interruption. You know, working with people is supposed to be what I do. But if I'm not careful, people can be the interruption. And if you're a Christian, serving and helping people is kind of what our heartbeat is supposed to be, because it's supposed to be Christ-like, putting others first. That's what he did. Sometimes we view people as the interruption, and we don't take time for people, and we feel so depleted, we don't even want to mess with more people. Where they need to feel Jesus' love. Man, did Jesus ever get depleted like that? Did he ever have a to-do list, and just as he's getting clicking on that to-do list, he gets interrupted? How did he handle that? I have a passage we'll look at today in Matthew 9. As we start Matthew 9, verse 18, let me just clarify, Jesus is already having his to-do list done. His to-do list for that day is speaking to a large group of people. It would be like if I'm teaching you today, that was on Jesus' list. He is teaching a large group of people who is coming out to see him. And they said, man, Jesus is here. We are going to listen to him. And Jesus is enjoying teaching and influencing people. He has this large crowd in front of him, and he's ready to go. This was what he planned to do that day. He has his talk ready. He has everything down. He has everybody organized. As he's teaching, here is what happens. Matthew 9, 18 says, while he spake these things unto them, behold, there came a certain ruler and worshipped him, saying. So he is interrupted. Jesus is right now stopped as he's teaching the group, saying, My daughter is even now dead, but come, lay the hand upon her, and she shall live. So Jesus is teaching, just like now, if a guy walked up, now if a guy came up right now and said, Hey, my daughter is dead, come and heal her, she shall live. I have to admit, I'd be pretty intimidated right at that moment. I have a lot of faith in God. I don't have any faith in me. So I would be intimidated and not know what to do. But Jesus just calmly looked as he's dealing with this crowd and teaching. Now a guy's came, hey, my daughter is dead. I'm sure the guy wasn't laughing at that moment. I'm sure the guy had a heavy heart. I'm sure the guy was probably weeping. I'm sure the guy was maybe a little hysterical or desperate. And he said, Jesus, you've got to help me right now. Isn't that how it always is? People want our help when? Right now. Not when it's convenient. Did you notice one more thing? This guy did say, Jesus, how is your day going? How are you? You know what, Jesus? I know you're busy. No, you notice, did the guy care about how Jesus was feeling that day? Did the guy ask? No. And sometimes when you help other people, they aren't going to care about you. They're going to care about themselves. They're hurting. Does that make it easy? No, it doesn't. 
But how many times do you see people in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, how many times do you see people come up and say, Jesus, how's your day going? Jesus, how do you feel today? Jesus, are you a little depleted? Jesus, do you need me to just keep people away from you for a little while today? I don't read that. You know what I read? Hey, Jesus, one more thing. Hey, Jesus, one more problem. Hey, Jesus, one more miracle needed. Hey, Jesus, come over here one more time. And Jesus is teaching, and he's interrupted by this man. Well-meaning, but he wants help. How did Jesus respond to this interruption to his day when he has influenced many people? Matthew 9, 19. Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciple. Jesus said, okay, fine, I'll go. And I don't imagine Jesus saying, oh, are you serious right now? One more thing. One more daughter died, and you have to come interrupt me. So what? Your daughter died. She went to heaven with Jesus. Isn't that enough for you? I mean, he could have answered in many ways, and many of those thoughts have crossed our minds if we've worked with people before, but Jesus just calmly said, yeah, let me get up. Let me go with you. So Jesus' teaching is interrupted by a man whose daughter just died. So he says, fine, I'll go help you. And he goes and helps them, and he has this whole crowd waiting, like, okay, what about us? But he leaves. As he's leaving with the first interruption, let's look at the next verse. Something else happened, Matthew 9, 20. And behold, a woman, which was diseased with an issue of blood, 12 years, came behind him and touched the hem of his garment. Matthew 9, 21. For she said within herself, if I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. So Jesus right there is interrupted, is going with a man who is weeping, saying, my daughter is now dead. Can you do anything? Jesus said, sure, I'll go with you. Jesus gets up. As he turns to go, someone else interrupts the interruption. A lady comes behind and has disease and just wanted to get a hold of Jesus Christ. What did she want? She wanted something from him. As Jesus is giving of himself to an entire crowd and pouring himself into the crowd, a man interrupts him and says, hey, change your schedule. Come help my daughter. Jesus said, fine, I'll give to you. And as he's trying to leave to give to him, as he turns to go and walk, someone else takes from him again. And Jesus handles this situation far better than I handle the interruptions of life when people just want one more thing from me, when I feel depleted, when I feel tired, and I don't know what else to do, and man, I can't get anything done because all these people, God, that you sent me down to help. So just a thought. If you live a life of helping others, expect more interruptions, not less. Let me just caution you. If you want to live a life of helping others, expect more interruptions, not less. I wish I could tell you differently, and I don't always handle it well, but I can tell you this, when I am truly yielded to doing the Lord's will, I get interrupted by people who have needs regularly. And it's not always convenient, and they usually don't ask me how I'm feeling and they, what they, I, they can do for me. It's usually what can I do for them. And Jesus handled this with such class and such love and such grace and such mercy. He is an amazing example of what we are supposed to do. And when I ever handle it right, I really do feel re-energized. And I feel like I can continue to give back a little more. Matthew 9, 22. Here's how Jesus handled the second interruption to his day. Jesus turned to him about when he saw her, he said, daughter... Be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole, and the woman was made whole from that hour. Look at how he worded it. Daughter, be of good comfort. What tact, what love, what grace. How many of you have a coworker that just annoys you and gets on your nerves? You know what they need? You to handle the interruption the same way Jesus handled this one. You have a boss that really can be a little overbearing. You have an employee that works for you that just gets on your nerves. You have a neighbor that when you come home, they just want to talk to you. Are you serious or not? I have a long day at work. I need to get inside. They just want to talk to you. You stop and you go into the gas station. You go into a convenience store. And that clerk, man, they just want to talk to you about themselves. They never ask about you. They just want to talk about themselves. You think, oh, what an interruption. Where Jesus would have viewed that as an opportunity to show them the love of Christ. The love of God that flowed through him. So many times I have taken those same interruptions and I've handled them the opposite the way Jesus handled it here. And every time I live to regret it. Oh, for the grace 
to handle interruptions of life, to handle people's problems with the tact, love, and grace that Jesus Christ demonstrated for us here. Now Jesus, as he handles this interruption from being te- t- teaching the crowd, as the man comes and is weeping, saying, my daughter is dead, Jesus said, that's great, I'll help you, I'll go with you. As he turns and is interrupted again, and people take energy, strength from him again. They touch him with his garment. He doesn't get frustrated or angry or say, come on, right now, can you guys just give me a break? As I've done many times. Oh, are you serious? Are you calling me again right now? I just did this. Are you, why are they knocking on my door again? One more stupid text, one more email, one more problem. What in the world? God, why do you keep doing this to me? Jesus could have said any of that, but he didn't. But as Jesus walks with this man to his house, I can only imagine Jesus saying, man, does anyone really care what I'm doing? But no, he's going to give of himself one more time. Maybe he's going to get a pat on the back this time. Maybe they're really going to appreciate him this time. As he healed the last lady, did all the crowd give him a standing ovation? Did the lady say much? We don't know. We don't see that. If you're serving Jesus Christ by helping others and desiring a pause and a pat on the back, I hope you get it. Let me be honest, many times you're not going to right away. You're going to have to handle it the same way Jesus did. Matthew 9, 24, Jesus said, as he arrives at this house, give place, for the maid is not dead but sleepeth. And they said, oh, thank you for taking time from teaching an entire crowd to come heal this guy's daughter. What did they do? They laughed him to scorn. Have you ever tried to help somebody and they don't appreciate it? Have you ever tried to go out of your way to help somebody and they just kind of make fun of Jesus or they make fun of what you're even trying to do and you don't feel appreciated at all and you wonder, what in the world? Why am I even trying to do this? Why am I giving of myself? God, I am trying to show them your love. Well, I guess one good thing about it is they did that to Jesus Christ too. They laughed him to scorn. What are you doing? She's dead. You can't do anything. What do you do in Matthew 9, 25? When the people were put out, or put forth, hey, Jesus is like, hey, can you, do you mind getting them out of here? Can you do that? He went in, took her by the hand, and the maid arose. He solved the problem. He gave him himself. He gave his time and his energy to help one more person. If you look at the next verse, it says Matthew 9, 26, the fame hereof went abroad into all the land. Now, I don't think that fame right there was people that were coming to pat Jesus on the back and say, man, Jesus, we just want to right now give back to you. You know what they wanted? You know why his fame went abroad? What they could get from him. Expect more interruptions, not less. Are you living your life in such a busy state of hurry that you're neglecting the most important things? Do you ever take the time in your way to work and say, God, help me to see the interruptions of life today as your son saw them? Do you ever pray and say, Jesus, man, with the tact and grace and love that you handled the interruptions as you lived on earth, can I handle them the same way? Do you ever look at a problem that comes across your desk your phone, or someone stops you, just say, I want to thank you, Jesus, for the opportunity to handle this and show people how you would handle it. Because many times I have failed miserably at this. I can get so busy in my to-do list. How many of you ever like to write a checklist for yourself to get done? Anybody besides me? How many of you get great satisfaction I still do it on paper. You know why? Because when I cross that last thing off, you know what I get to do? Throw it away. I get great satisfaction out of that. If I write one thing on a list and then crumple, if I'm really frustrated, it's like one, throw it away. What'd you write on there? Tie my shoes. But you know what? Throw it away. Eat some food. Crumple it up. Throw it away. I'm hitting my potential today. You ever feel that way? You ever wonder if Jesus felt that way? But as Jesus is teaching, God interrupted to go heal a man's daughter. When he got to the man's house, they laughed him to scorn. He said, you don't know what you're doing. 
But even in between there, he gets touched by a lady again, had an issue, and she was so desperate, saying, if I could just get to that person, it would heal me. Oh, for me to take time today for the interruptions that God puts on my path. Some of you right now, you may have been saved just a few weeks. Some of you may have been in church a long time. Do you know that God has someone for you to help this week? Do you know if there's an interruption waiting for you where they need to feel the love of God through you? God wants to use you. Some of you this morning were used by God, but you become so busy or so caught in getting the next thing, you missed it. You missed as you tried to show love to a child this morning. You missed the look back when you weren't looking of that child looking at you with eyes that say, they do care. You missed it when you tried to help somebody this morning or pat them on the back and said, man, I'm glad you're here. You missed the fact that they looked back and said, man, that person loves me. You missed it. Don't miss it. When you serve the Lord and get his will done, let it soak in. Just as Jesus did, you accomplish God's will. Who have you rushed by today just so you could finish your to-do list? Unfortunately, that's probably been me many times. I've rushed by opportunities and interruptions to work in my life because I'm too tired, because I'm too busy, I'm too depleted, I don't have anything more to give, no one cares about me, and I've missed the hand of God trying to work in my heart, in my life. Next is another statement I saw, be efficient with processes. So you can be inefficient with relationships. You may not need this quote. I do. You know why? Because I like efficiency. You know what? People are very inefficient. What if I planned time to go out to eat with my wife? I said, honey, we're going to go out to this restaurant you like. She excited about that. We sit down to eat and we order. I said, you know what? I pre-ordered. Oh, really? Yep, I pre-ordered. You know why? Because I figured it out. If I pre-order and we eat fast, we don't have to spend an hour here together. We could spend 14 minutes. It's going to be great. It's going to be so efficient. Aren't you excited about that? She'd probably say yes, because right now I don't really want to see you. <laughs> you know why? Because time I spend with her is well spent, but it can be very inefficient. And when you try to help other people or you try to read your Bible and pray, it can be very inefficient. And that's okay. So be efficient with the processes of life. Be efficient with how much time you spend on social media, how much time you spend watching television, how much time you spend playing games, how much time you spend with a video screen in front of you. Be very efficient with that so you can be very inefficient with the people God puts on your life. Last, what is hurry robbing you of today? What is it robbing you of? You want to get more done, but you also want to be depleted. You're missing out. Jesus Christ refilling you. You're co laboring with God. If there's anybody in the room today where you feel like, man, I don't even understand what you're talking about. What do you mean partnering with God? Maybe you don't know for sure you're going to go to heaven someday. Maybe you've never partnered with God by saying, God, I trust you fully with my eternity. I want to put all my faith and trust in you to take me to a place called heaven. Maybe you've never done that before. You may have been in a hurry of life and you've never taken the time to do that, but if this morning you have any question and say, man, is that for me? Would he love me enough? This is your interruption to your busy life. Jesus Christ wants you, when I pray in a minute, he wants you to come forward and say, you know what? I've been too hurried in my life to hear about Jesus Christ, but someone down front will introduce you to him and show you the true peace that only Jesus can give you. If you've never met Jesus Christ in a way where you've put your faith in him, please come forward and let yourself trust him. Maybe you've been too busy and you've missed all the opportunities hurry's robbing you of today and you've missed the opportunities to show other people what Jesus' love is really like, how he lived as he handles interruptions. Then you could come and say, God, help me to live a life where I see the needs you put in front of me. I need you to help me get past the interruptions. Maybe some of you have served so many people and you've gotten interrupted so many times that you're depleted. Maybe you just need to come and say, God, take away the hurry. 
refill my heart. God, I want to recharge. Because if the people you help don't care about you and they don't, they're so consumed with their own needs, it's not that they're trying to be mean, but they're so consumed with their own wants, their own needs, their own desires, that they forget about you. Jesus Christ does care about you. And he does want to refill your tank and make it where you can keep serving him. If the devil can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. Please don't be too busy for the Lord. If you've never met the Lord, I want to encourage you when I pray to come forward and meet him. If you have met him and you just say, yeah, I just need to recharge, just sit there whether your seat or forward to say, you know what, God, I need to reconnect to you. I need to do this often because I get too hurried for Jesus Christ. Let me encourage you to not be too busy to take time for the Lord also.